Pepto-Bismol is the brand name for an antacid medication containing the chemical bismuth subsalicylate. Bismuth subsalicylate is made by the hydrolysis of bismuth salicylate, which is simply ionic bismuth bound to salicylate. When taken orally, this chemical reacts with stomach acid to form insoluble bismuth oxychloride and salicylic acid. And as the active ingredient in aspirin, salicylic acid has anti-inflammatory properties and the bismuth oxychloride inhibits intestinal fluid secretion and excessive motion in the stomach. These are the main therapeutic effects of Pepto-Bismol, and the chemical itself is actually a very weak antacid with no real buffering effect. Anyway, what I find interesting is that this medication actually contains a significant amount of bismuth, which can be isolated fairly easily, particularly from the pill form. If I take a look at the label, each pill contains 262 milligrams of bismuth subsalicylate, which corresponds to 151.3 milligrams of elemental bismuth. Since there are 40 pills in each bottle, I should technically be able to extract around 12 grams from the two bottles I have here. To do this, I first needed to powder the pills and soak them in 400 milliliters of warm hydrochloric acid. I used a 12 molar solution here diluted down to 4 molar to be safe, but you could probably get away with using an even lower concentration. Now the role of the hydrochloric acid here is to dissolve the bismuth subsalicylate forming salicylic acid and soluble bismuth chloride. The reason I use such a strong solution is that making it too weak will result in formation of insoluble bismuth oxychloride, which again is what happens in your relatively weak stomach acid. I went ahead and left this on my hot plate under constant stirring and a bit of heat, and after about 30 minutes I felt that the bismuth was probably completely dissolved, so I went ahead and passed the slurry through a coffee filter to separate my bismuth chloride from the pill binder material and the salicylic acid. Unfortunately, the precipitated salicylic acid along with whatever binder material was used here was very difficult to filter and held onto a lot of liquid. To help remedy this and to make sure I maximized my recovery of bismuth, I rinsed the white crap in the filter with 150 milliliters of warm 2 molar hydrochloric acid. Once this was completely done filtering, I was left with a very acidic solution containing bismuth chloride and probably a small amount of dissolved salicylic acid. Now, converting bismuth ions to bismuth metal from this point is fairly easy, and all I had to do was dilute it with some distilled water to prevent the reaction from getting out of hand, and then toss in some aluminum foil. Aluminum is a strongly reducing metal compared to bismuth, meaning it's very electropositive and has a much greater affinity for electronegative chlorine ions than bismuth does. Because of this, the chloride ions will leave bismuth and bind to the aluminum, which displaces three electrons from the aluminum. These electrons will immediately replace the three electron deficit of the ionic bismuth and produce elemental bismuth metal, which appears as little black specks that settle to the bottom of the beaker. This is called a single replacement or a single displacement reaction, and it's a type of redox reaction where an aluminum is oxidized and bismuth is reduced. I use this method fairly often to precipitate metals, and aluminum will effectively precipitate several metals, including gold, platinum, mercury, silver, copper, lead, tin, nickel, and cobalt, in that order. The metals iron, chromium, zinc, and manganese can also be precipitated this way, but they will all quickly react with excess acid in the solution, which makes this a somewhat inefficient process. Aluminum itself, along with the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals, can really only be practically precipitated by using molten salt electrolysis. Anyway, I keep adding more aluminum foil as it dissolves, and this is continued until no more bismuth is precipitating from the solution. At this point, I simply give the bismuth powder some time to settle to the bottom before collecting it all by vacuum filtration. I then rinsed the bismuth powder thoroughly with isopropyl alcohol to remove any residual acid and help it to dry faster. This was then vacuum desiccated at room temperature for a few hours to make sure that the bismuth powder was completely and totally dry. I then went ahead and weighed my dry bismuth powder and I got a final mass of 11.4 grams, which represents a 94% yield. This is pretty good, and honestly if you just need bismuth metal, I would recommend stopping here. However, I thought it would be cool to try to make this into a solid nugget of bismuth metal, which turned this project from a fun experiment into an unpleasant experience. Bismuth has a low melting point of only 271 degrees Celsius, so in theory it should have been fairly easy to melt this down. However, in practice, bismuth very readily reacts with oxygen in the air when heated to form the off-white bismuth oxide, especially in the powder form due to the high surface area. 
With this in mind, my first attempt to try to minimize oxidation was to melt this down in a test tube. This worked at first and did a pretty good job at minimizing the formation of oxides, but I ended up running into a lot of issues. The problem was that as the bismuth began to melt together, it contracted away from the glass, and since the metal was no longer in contact with the glass, it cooled and re-solidified, which made it impossible to push back down and continue melting. It also gave all the heat I was blasting the tube with nowhere to go, which caused a hole to form in my glass and forced me to restart the process in a new tube. For my second attempt, I basically just applied the heat a lot more slowly while constantly pushing the metal powder down with a stir rod to keep it in contact with the surface of the test tube. This did effectively prevent the test tube from being ruined, but no matter how much heat I applied, the bismuth didn't seem to want to melt. Using flux didn't seem to make any difference, and despite exceeding the boiling point of bismuth, it completely and totally refused to melt. For my third attempt, I transferred my bismuth powder to a small crucible, added more useless flux, covered it, and heated it to red heat for 30 minutes. This rather excessive method did finally result in some bismuth liquefying under a thick oxide layer. I then went ahead and poured out my bismuth metal into another dish, waited for it to cool, and waited. In the end of this step, I got a mass of 3.46 grams, which is notably less than I started with. Obviously here, I lost a lot of bismuth to oxidation, some more was lost between attempts, and honestly I probably lost some to vaporization, as I did heat this to several hundred degrees above the boiling point of bismuth. The yield here would likely be a lot better, as a percentage at least, if I did this a much larger scale, and it was honestly just quite difficult to work with such a small amount of metal powder. As you can see here, there was also a fairly substantial amount of bismuth metal left behind in the crucible that had fused to the oxide layer. I did briefly try and dissolve away the oxides and melt the remaining bismuth down to try to collect a little more, but at this even smaller scale, it really just resulted in the formation of even more bismuth oxides, so I gave up. In any case, I went ahead and melted my small piece of crude bismuth down to try and remove as much slag as possible and this left me with a tiny nugget of fairly pure bismuth metal. Now, truth be told, I kind of wanted bismuth crystals to exist in this video, but I didn't think it was feasible with such a tiny nugget, so I placed it into a mini crucible along with a lot more bismuth I had on hand. This was heated slowly until it all melted down, which was mercifully fast compared to trying to melt down the powder. It still took a while though, so while it melts, here are a few fun facts about bismuth, which happens to be one of my favorite metals. Bismuth is a brittle post-transition metal that is nearly as dense as lead, but not nearly as soft. It's one of the most diamagnetic, but least thermally conductive metals known, and it's remarkably non-toxic. I say remarkably non-toxic because bismuth is in the same group as arsenic and antimony, and it's in the same period as thallium and polonium. One last fact about bismuth is that it was long believed to be the element with the largest atomic mass that did not undergo spontaneous nuclear decay. However, in 2003, it was found that bismuth does decay, it simply has a half-life longer than the age of the universe, which makes lead-206 the heaviest stable isotope. Anyway, once all the lead had liquefied, I went ahead and scraped the slag off the surface and allowed it to cool down slowly for about 5 minutes to allow crystals to form. The amount of time you want to wait to allow crystals to form is super variable and really depends on how much bismuth you're crystallizing, as well as the ambient temperature. Regardless, when I felt like I had some good crystals form, I went ahead and poured off my excess bismuth, and this left behind some beautiful bismuth crystals which were initially golden yellow. This color quickly changed to red and then a bluish purple which was really cool to see in person. I might try and grow more bismuth crystals in the future, but I certainly won't be getting that bismuth from Pepto-Bismol. And as a rule of thumb, extractions are not efficient ways to obtain chemicals, and there's really only four reasons you would do an extraction. One would be that the chemical you're extracting is harmful to the environment, so it's extracted before the other material can be disposed of, and a car battery would be a good example here. A second reason might be that the chemical you're extracting is cheaper to extract from waste than from the environment, and precious metals are a good example here. A third reason might be that the chemical you're extracting isn't readily available for you as a non-commercial consumer, and some examples here might include styrene, benzene, aniline, etc. And the fourth, final, and most important reason you might do an extraction is for fun. Now, looking at bismuth, bismuth is cheap, it's non-toxic, and so the only reason you'd extract bismuth would be for fun. 
That said, I wouldn't recommend going this route if you need bismuth for something, but it was an interesting process to do. Anyway, that's all I've got for today, and I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank my incredible patrons for their very generous contributions. Your support is incredibly vital and very, very appreciated. And to everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.